It's all right, we should do Shut it. Shit. Do it, because all ours are serious anyway, so we should. Uh, I just, does it even matter anymore? <laughs> no, Take <yeah>. 10. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, shit. Back again. There we go. You press the big red button. There so we go. If that's not on and that is. No, it's different. This, this is going to be like this our is... mouse moving on it. No, 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 that's just audio, that one. Ah, sick, all right. But it records through that as well. All right, there you go. This is how you podcast. This is how the fucking bro <laughs> do it, mate. <right>. Back. <laughs> Make it master my podcast, part four. Neil, take it away. Boom. What are we talking about today? Political correctness. Whether mm. it's a good thing or a bad thing, whether it's gone too far, whether it hasn't gone far enough, um, and how that kind of permeates all of our lives, consciously or unconsciously. Um, so obviously, political correctness, I mean, it's been a thing since as long as I can remember. And it becomes, it's been more of a thing in kind of the last 10 years as everybody tries to align their ideology to a set of beliefs that seem um, publicly appealing. Whether or not you believe that as an individual or not, there's pressure on you to think a certain way, to say certain things. Um, you've only got to look at the political arena to see that. Mm. Um, you get any one of these guys on there and get a soundbite from them, and it could have been a soundbite that came literally from anybody. It's just a line of, <clears throat> a constant stream of sentences that are the same as the, the previous guy. Um so yeah, it's about whether political correctness is, is a good thing or a bad thing, um, or whether it's whether it's somewhere in the middle. Mm. So what are some of the examples? Let's give like so a few a few examples of political correctness. Well, the, I mean, well, the race thing's an obvious thing. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, um, my mum and dad would send me invariably every Friday night to the Chinky to go get my takeaway. You can't say that anymore. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, I don't know. I don't know. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Things that were said that were deemed to be absolutely fine, even five years ago, are now terribly offensive. Um, and then, to tell it even further, obviously now we've got so much debate around gender fluidity, around um, gay rights, trans rights, pansexual rights, what is a man, what is a woman, where is the line, that even if you have an opinion that differs from um, the liberal left, so to speak, where everything, any, everything's fine, anything can go... If your opinion differs to that, then you're instantly labelled as a bigot or a racist or a homophobe or a transphobe. There's no individuality of thought and there's no assessment as to why you think what you think and where that thought process has come from. It's just that, oh, you don't agree with the consensus, you're a racist, you're a bigot, you're a transphobe, you're a homophobe. And you see that a lot, especially with um, this play. I mean, where America leads, the UK tends to follow, right? So these things were obviously blown up in America first. There was a case very recently, I think it was last year, or maybe settled at the start of this year, um, you guys probably heard about it. I think it was Colorado with the um, the Christian bakery. Oh, the guys that owned the bakery, the guys that owned this bakery were, were Christians, um, and they'd been approached by a gay couple to make a wedding cake for their wedding. And this Christian couple that owned the shop had just politely declined and said, "We don't want to do that because we we don't believe in gay marriage." And it goes against our personal beliefs. Um, the gay couple sued. Um, originally, I believe they won the case and won damages, and then on appeal they lost it. So it comes down to your freedom of speech, your freedom of individuality, whether you have the right to serve or not serve someone based on certain th characteristics, whether it be race, gender, etc. Um, and that was a case that really divided opinion, completely divided opinion. So where does your right to be served, for instance, in a cafe or a restaurant, where does that intervene with a person that owns that cafe or restaurant, their right to say to you, no, this is mine, I don't want to serve you? Whose right trumps whose? Where's the line? And is the guy that owns that bakery shop within his rights to say, I disagree with this, so I'm not going to do it, without being labelled as some sort of homophobe, which, by the way, he was, almost destroyed his business. Um, where's the right and wrong line in that? That's Where weird. is it? Well, the problem is there's probably in a line, is there? There probably isn't really a line. No, but there's got to be. That's uh, the thing with this stuff, because you, you've got you to enshrine these things in law. And in statute, so there has to be a line somewhere that we can that we can refer back to. Mm. Um, and the question is, where is that line? And why have we be, we got to a place where we feel the need to invoke legislation and invoke law when you and I simply disagree or something? Mm. Yeah, nah. I, I guess that, that, that's, that's probably to try and get some sort of result out of it. I don't know. Maybe those people were upset. Oh no, they were. But, but this have. isn't, and this, this is the this is the terrifying thing. If you do your research on this, and I have done these 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 are not isolated incidences. 
These are happening all the time, these sorts of things. Mm. You're just pushing back the boundary. And it especially happens when you people are making judgments based on a religious context. So, you know, the religion comes into attack as well. Mm. Um, but it's fascinating to me. Was the guy that turns down making a wedding cake for a gay couple, is he homophobic? Well, he's just religious, isn't he? He's just, li- he's just living by what he believes to be true. Mm. All right. But does that make him homophobic? You know, I, if, he, yeah. if you ask me to put me on the spot, I would say yes. Okay, I disagree completely. That's good. <laughs> right. It's good for this podcast. Yeah, let's do it. Well, even, even the phobia thing, homophobic, transphobic, it, it's nonsense. Well, know, phobia it, is a bit of a, it, it's an extreme term, isn't it? Like, well, a phobia is an irrational fear. Yeah. Okay, I don't think anyone has an irrational fear of gay people, generally speaking. Um, but it, if I, see, I, and I've got a unique perspective on this because I was very religious mm-hmm. up until I was sort of 24, 25. I mean, very, very religious, you know. Um, I wasn't the most orthodox person in the world, but I absolutely believed what I was what I was living. Um, and so I was raised Mormon. So in the Mormon church, they are very opposed to gay marriage. They spent millions of pounds in America opposing Proposition 8. Proposition 8 was the law that tried to legalize gay marriage in America back in 2011, 2012, whenever it was. Um, now, I was against, I, mean, I was a Mormon at the time, so I was against my church spending their money to, to oppose legislation. Um, but I believed at that time that homosexuality was a sin and that gay marriage should be legal, should be fine, but that it was still a sin. Because I, I even then, I, I believed there should be a separation between my personal beliefs, my religious beliefs, and the systems that govern society. So just as a disclaimer, I, don't, I no longer believe homosexuality is a sin. That was an odd religious me. I've, you know, I'm not that person now. But there was, there, was, there was a separation. But also I know that even though when I held those beliefs, I, was in, I, you know, I had gay friends. Um, you know, I, I, I worked with a guy who I became very close to, um, spent Christmases with him, New Year's with him, who, who was married to a gay guy. Um, so my religious beliefs in no way conflict with my beliefs that he should be free to pursue the lifestyle and the happiness that he wanted to. Um, but nobody else would see it like that. They would see that my belief that gay marriage shouldn't be legalised or that homosexuality was, was sinful behaviour would instantly banish me a homophobe. And that's the danger. Because once you, once you say to me or to anybody, you're a homophobe, you're a transphobe, you're a racist, it, the conversation's done. Because I can't really defend that point yeah. adequately. If you've decided that I'm a racist or a homophobe, nothing I say to you from this point on, generally speaking, is going to sway you back from that belief. Yeah. So there's no, there's, no, there's no ability, not ability, rather, sorry, there's no desire um, to say, okay, why do you believe that? Let me break it down. What's got you to that point? You know, and can we agree to disagree? Because we used to be we used to be able to agree to disagree, you know, and then to be able to move on and put things in the rightful place. Whilst now there seems to be an underlying narrative, um, a social narrative that says this is the right way. Okay, these are the these are the these are the beliefs that we have now. These are the core popular beliefs. Anything you believe that's not aligned with this, you're a scumbag. You're a bigot. Mm-hmm. You're a homophobe. That's the dangerous place. Is that you cannot disagree with the crowd now. Without without being castigated for it, and that's and you say in celebrity culture, you see that every. I mean, yeah. what was it? Was, um, what's a little funny comedian called? Obviously, he's funny as a comedian. Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart. So Kevin Hart got was it the Oscars? Yeah, the Oscars. So Kevin Hart tweet. got binned off from hosting the Oscars for a tweet he made 10, 15 years ago. Ages ago, yeah. So long. Ten or fifteen years ago, he got binned off for it. You know, there was a politician recently who was fired um, from the Brexit party for tweets he made ten years ago. He was a different human being 10 years ago. I was a different human being 10 years ago. And then, this is another fascinating crossroads, is it ties back in. You get these guys on, on, on the left, liberal side, who pride themselves on being progressive and liberal and encouraging and inclusive and equality. Um, and, but there's no forgiveness. Yeah, that's You it. fucked up 10 years ago. How dare you? Mm. You're a homophobe. Boom, done. Career over. I'm going to end your career. Yeah. You know, now there's, there's, there's reporters whose specific job is to trawl back through your social media history and look at any single politically correct mistake you've ever made and then to ruin your career on the back of it. So it's fascinating because like you're all for inclu- inclusivity but, but we won't forgive you if you fuck up. If you fuck up, it's done. It's game over. You'll be forever a racist or forever a homophobe or forever a bigot. It's like, really? When do we become, when do we be, we become so soft? Mm. I know? think a lot of the problem mm. is, I don't know, people seem to live and stick by like, like by groups and individual groups that you know mm-hmm. label themselves to that and anything outside of that is alien now I don't oh, believe it doesn't exist yeah that's the problem it's, 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 it's really paradoxical because 
So all throughout my twenties, I was kind of a hardened socialist. Yeah, I believed that capitalism was the, the great scourge in society. Um, it was a, it was an evil system. It kept people behind. Socialism was the only thing that would save us. Um, the truth was very much black and white, um, which is all nonsense. And I've, I've moved on from that now. But what's paradoxical about it is that truth is black and white. But in the middle of that black and white, there are a thousand shades of grey that we can't ignore either. Mm. You know, so it's a very very difficult thing to be able to figure out. But um, <clears throat> you have to be able to. And one of the most important things is being able to look at your own belief system, your own structure. And then just to genuinely question, right, why do I think this way? You know, why do I think the way that I think? Where does it come from and how much of it is really true? But any time, I've got a, one of my best friends, probably my best friend actually, um, is an American guy, lives in America, he's a firefighter. And he's a, he's a very liberal progressive guy, good guy, got an amazing heart, you know, his, his intentions are pure always. But he's incredibly black and white. And he's kind of like, if you're against gay marriage, you're a homophobe. If you're against trans rights, you, you're, you're a transphobe. Um, if you don't support Black Lives Matter, you're a racist. You don't, you don't understand your white privilege. And it's like, once you say those things, you've shut the conversation between us down. Like, I disagree with all those points, but I've, I, I think I've got intelligent, well thought out, well articulated answers to why I disagree. And if you would take the time to listen to them, we could probably get somewhere. But it's the idea that if you have any divergent opinion, you are the enemy. You know, and that's just, and it's not true. And I, I know that from being a religious guy and holding opinions that religiously would make people feel uneasy. But I know that my religious uh, uh, beliefs at the time never really manifested themselves in how I wanted society to be run. You know, I wasn't looking to build a, the a, a theocracy, a theocracy rather. You feel like people just will not actually say their opinions on stuff now <clears throat> because of social media. Like, it kind of makes no, it, it's kind of like a weird paradox that. Social media means that everyone has an opinion, but what's we'll the true opinion? Because you'll probably get fucked over for it, and oh, then no, it'll be and then it'll be condensed down. Like we could say one thing now, trim it right down, and it could look fucking dreadful. Like mm. you said a few things then, and then you could just clip it and clip it and clip it, and it oh, sounds yeah. dreadful. And then you fucked forever. So now people just won't say anything. Mm. It's like the opposite. It's like oh, we've got a platform to say stuff. Yeah, don't say it though, because it's going to be really bad for well, you. Even as I was saying some of those things to you, internally I'm kind of cringing, and then I had to go, just to add the caveat, Yeah, 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 yeah I, know, I don't yeah, believe yeah. that anymore, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And yeah. it's like, I know this stuff's bullshit, and there's still that part of me that goes, tell me you, long, no, you no longer think that, you know? Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think people are afraid. And the thing is, when it, I have lots of individual conversations, one-on-ones with people, who will go, oh, fucking can't stand political, this is bullshit, I can't say this, can't say that, because I didn't... And there seems to be a general consensus that people hate this, but it's but it's not it's been spread enough and it's pervasive enough that the overriding narrative of our culture is becoming dominated by political correctness. Yet the people who live underneath it don't seem to want it. But for whatever reason, we, we go along with it. We're mm. going along with it, even though we're like it's bullshit. And we've just said now, well, we say things we probably won't say, but we don't believe them to be true. You know, so people are definitely scared, and and they're scared for good reason. Scared. People are losing their jobs over this stuff. They're scared for good reason, you know. And then you've got guys on the other side of the aisle, like Mano Yiolopoulos, um, Alex Jones, Jordan Peterson. All these guys at some point have been banned from Twitter, banned from YouTube. Jordan Peterson's book was banned in Canada. And Jordan Peterson doesn't say a single goddamn controversial thing. He just happened to believe, you know, that you shouldn't be you shouldn't be forced by law to call people by their pronouns. You know, it's a perfectly legitimate belief, and he articulated it well. He was banned in an entire country for holding that belief. I mean, think of the madness of that. That is pretty mad, though, isn't it? He was banned. In, yeah. <clears throat> but it's the assumptions that we make. There's an assumptions made that you, you must be a piece of shit. Unless you live by an ethos that says everything goes. Be whoever you want to be. Chase whatever you want to chase. There are no longer any rules. All bets are off. Unless you subscribe to that, then you're out. Of the, of the political conversation. And socially, you're, you're, you're out of it. You're, you're absolutely out. You know? And there's, and there's, uh, there's examples of this everywhere. Have you heard of a guy called Douglas Murray? No, I haven't. No. Douglas Murray is a genius. I recommend anyone listening to this and you guys get on to him. Absolute genius. He's um he's a young guy, he's only 35, 36, I think. Um so he's he's that nightmare for liberals in as much as he's a gay conservative, a gay Jewish conservative, so they have no idea where to put him. But he's just written a book called The Madness of Crowds. And it's it's about this group think that we have, um, where unless you think a certain way and believe a certain way then you'll be ostracized by the crowd and how many people actually believe these things or they're just so terrified of losing a job and not being seen as PC correct. And it, it, it gives a fascinating example. This blew my mind. It's the sort of thing no one believes unless, you, unless you're unless you aware, unless you're looking for it. So 
Google is the number one giver of information in the world. You don't know anything you go to Google. Like that gives Google an enormous amount of power, a terrifying amount of power. And I'm the same. If I Google something, that's true. Whatever I Google is true. So he was looking at the algorithms of Google and saying, well, how much of this is being permeated by the big tech companies? And how much are they trying to say this is what you should believe? So he went onto there and he Googled um, white couples. Okay, went onto Google Images, scrolled down two or three pages. There were no pictures of white couples. That's what he'd asked for. There was no pictures of that. There was pictures of mixed race couples. There was pictures of black couples. There was pictures of gay couples. There was no pictures of white couples, none. You type in um, black couples and there are pictures after picture of gorgeous um, black couples, beautiful women, chiseled abs, all looking really, really happy. And that's uh, that's exactly what you want. If you type in straight couples, you get pictures of gay couples. Um, This this sounds mental. Anyone can go in there and do this now. Okay, it's there. Unless I've changed algorithms in the last couple of days. And... I watched Murray being interviewed about why this was, because it even surprised the interviewer. And Murray was going, why? Why is this? And Murray was like, I don't know exactly. He said, but it seems to be an underwriting narrative of an assumption that your um, your core character is bad if you want to look at straight couples or white couples. And it says, it's almost like Google saying, yeah, we'll, we'll show you, you piece of shit. You want white couples, I'm going to give you mixed race couples. I'm going to give you black couples. Yeah. It's almost like there's an assumption that, that anything beyond that um, sorry, anything beyond being sort of white, cis, normative culture somehow means that you're going against the curve. And it sounded really extreme. And so I did, I was like, Jesus Christ, yeah. It, it's, that's real. That's there. There's something that's, that's stopping that happening. It's, it's, it's unbelievable, you know. And um, this, that's the company that gives us almost all our information. And then you have YouTube and you have Facebook and Twitter. All of these people have cancelled people or deplatform people who have opinions that are counter to the central narrative that we have at the moment. Well, it's happening a lot now. A lot of people are getting demonetized for yep. what they're speaking about. Like freedom mm-hmm. of speech is a big thing now on the internet. Mm-hmm. There's all this shit about Julian Assange with all the yeah. these data leak and yeah. going to jail for telling the truth about what's happened. Mm-hmm. So why is that happening where there's good information out there, but it's being suppressed somehow? It shouldn't even matter if it's good or bad though. It should just be if I because if I stand out on the street now, I can say whatever the fuck I want and it's not censored at all. Yeah. But if you say it online, you type it. Mm. If I yeah, say Julian, you're a prick now, you can't delete that. But if I say it online, you can go, Oh, this, you said this to me, block him, take him off Twitter, don't put him on YouTube. So it's like there isn't online, there's just no freedom of speech ever. It shouldn't even matter what you say. Like if you have mm. true freedom of speech, you should be allowed, even if it's fucking dreadful, you should be allowed to say what you want. Yeah, which you can, but then people are being demonetized. You know, people's videos are not being shown. Which is yeah, censorship. That's the same, so you're same censorship. censorship. So there's no, there isn't freedom of speech. Yeah, no. there's freedom of speech. Yeah, free to say what you want until the guy that owns the business says that's say. gone too far. Mm. Yeah. In fact, Rogan did a podcast on this. He had them. Um, I forget the guy's name, Jack something, but the guy that on Twitter. Oh yeah, yeah Jack Dorsey. Yeah. Jack Dorsey, yeah, and he had him on, and Jack Dorsey brought his lawyer on with him, and they were saying, well, so why have these people been deplatformed, and why has this guy not been deplatformed? And there was people. They were making comments about um, about Trump, you know, I'm gonna blow up the White House, etc. Trump's this and that, and they would that post would be removed. People would make um, no, sorry, that post would stand. People would make similar comments about politicians on the other side of the aisle, and that would be fine. That would be allowed. And he was saying, look, there's clearly a bias here in terms of left and right. There's clearly a bias towards we anything on the left is acceptable, even if we're saying hateful things. But anything that leans slightly towards the right, and we're gonna. We're going to take it off. We're going to demonetize those people. We're going to remove those comments. That there is no consistency of thought here. So what you're really saying is you can, and this is what the left says, you can think anything you want. You can say anything you want as long as it fits in this box. If it doesn't fit inside this box, we will kick you out of our circle and we will ostracize you. We will deplatform you. We will take away your ability to make a living. And it's it's madness. It's absolute madness. And then we'll just label it as hate speech, you know, which doesn't exist, by the way. There's no such thing as hate speech. There's just, they're just speech just speech the only thing you can't do is incite violence and i think that's 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 a good standard yeah. yeah if you're out there trying to incite violence amongst people and getting people to do physical harm to other people yeah as a society we've said no that's the benchmark you can't do that whether you're left right you can't do that as a society we will not tolerate that okay good what's next anything you say anything you want you can say anything that you want to say and that should be the benchmark but it's not it's not the benchmark. We've been, we've been, we have, we've 
pushed um, freedom of speech back so far that what should be this this incredible auditorium of, of, of public thought and public debate has now been condensed down into this tiny one-bedroom apartment, for a metaphor, where we're, that's it. Anything that doesn't fit in there, we can't talk about. And if you do talk about it, we'll ostracise you. And it's only going to get worse, really, because a lot of jobs will move online, a lot of stuff will be based around algorithms, so it'll just pick up what you talk about. This podcast can go anywhere to talk about anything, and if, it, if it's an algorithm on YouTube or itunes or something picks up something they don't like this podcast is fucking gone yeah and it will be like that mm. now forever unless because the problem is like people see facebook on youtube and and twitter as just ah it's just a website but these motherfuckers have more control <laughs> over us and what we think than your prime minister your president anything if they wanted i honestly think like if facebook wanted two countries to go to war they could probably make it happen yeah, we've seen, we've seen it with that. Oh, yeah, you, you can manufacture yeah. a, a, um, Easy. these campaigns, situation. you know, hate campaigns or whatever no, you want to call them. So no, no. it's it, it, it's gonna get it's gonna get worse, really. I can't see how it wouldn't. And it, but all right, then to throw in like a different, so we're not all agreeing. Sometimes you can say, oh, it is a good thing because is a virtual world going to be? Are they going to try and make a virtual world into a perfect world? Well, that's that's <laughs> that's what they're trying to do. Yeah, it's an echo chamber. And that's and that is the reason why. And we've all said, you know, when you're scrolling through Instagram or Twitter and whatnot, and you know, most of the people you follow are sharing the same memes and the same kind of things because we live in an echo chamber. You know, even these algorithms now are designed to give us exactly what we're looking and clicking on. Mm-hmm. So when you live in a world, technological um, or real, and you hear nothing but the same opinions you have, you speak to nobody but people that agree with what you're saying. You speak to nobody but people that are going, "I can't. That post was great." You know, I really get what you're saying. You, 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 you don't expand yourself in any way, shape, or form, and that's <clears throat> the thing that I went through. So, the, my political beliefs and social beliefs, economic beliefs now, are mirror opposites of what they were ten years ago. Mm. And that, that, I mean, that's painful to do it as well. It's painful to go, oh, right, the way in which I viewed the world for the vast majority of my life, I th- believe it to be wrong, and I think that's the thing that p- stops people from doing it. Is it's a very painful thing to do because your belief system whether it's political or social, moral or otherwise, that places you in the world. Mm-hmm. People don't pay enough attention to how important that is. What you believe is who you are, and it governs what you do. It governs how you speak. It governs the, the, the media you consume. It governs the food you eat. It governs the relationships you have. So when that set of, of beliefs changes or shifts slightly, that puts you in chaos, and you don't know what to do. It's why people stay in religions for so long. Why people stay in bad marriages for so long. Those things, good or bad, they at least place us in the world. You know, when you abandon that, you know, it's like being lost at sea and you just decide to throw away your life raft, you know? And it's, it's akin to that, and that's why people don't do it. It's understandable, really understandable. Yeah. Mm. Well, I just, I don't, I don't know how it, how it will even look in, in five years or so, do you know what I mean? Well, let's right, use a case, use a case of that, Baker, then. <clears throat> like, <clears throat> what, what would you guys do in that situation? Well, I was he within in his rights to turn that service down, or should he now be mandated by law to serve somebody who is behaving a lifestyle choice that he doesn't agree with? I just personally, I just think if that if they ordered that online, he would have made it, mm. and he didn't because he saw them. So it kind of makes it bad, I think, in my eyes, mm. because you physically sat there and saw someone. It's like, oh, it's like well, someone coming in here and say, "Oh, I'm doing a, a podcast." Yeah, so well, I guess black but, mm. because he saw it, but oh, we do it over the phone because we don't know who he is. Oh. Don't reduce Julian down to just a colour. <laughs> yeah, it's been done Jones. now. You're part, of the, you're part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, I, right, and the, part of me agrees with you, but the other side of the debate is just because it's wrong morally, it makes you feel uncomfortable, or just because it makes you feel a little bit, oh, that's not quite nice. Is that enough to make it illegal? Is that enough to take a man's business away from him? Is that enough to drag him through the courts? That's what I'm saying. This this need for retribution that we have. I don't like what you just said. You're a scumbag piece of shit. I'm taking you to court. Yeah. Do we want to go down that route as a society? <laughs> no. Or do we want to go, do you know what? You're a piece of shit. So I'm not going to shop in your business anymore. Yeah. And we've got an, we've got an amazing you know, online presence. I'm going to write a bad review. I'm going to do all those things. But I'm going to go that way and you go that way. I don't like what you do. Therefore, I'm going to avoid you. But I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to get the man involved. I don't want to get the government involved and, and legislate and statutes involved to, to limit what you can and can't do. Because if I'm free to 
marry my boyfriend, you should be free to oppose the fact that I marry my boyfriend. You should be free to oppose the fact that you don't want to make a cake for me. You know, the, and, and, the, and the problem with the left is it only recognizes one side as being a right. What, you have a right to be served no matter what. Do you? Really? So this guy doesn't have a right to hold an opinion that is uncomfortable to you. It may be an uncomfortable opinion. It may not be what you agree with. But what you're really saying is you have no right to that opinion. And I will attempt to beat that opinion out of you via law. And this is the real dangerous thing, is that freedom of speech needs to be governed by a sense of, how would you say, of, of social maturity. And we live in a world where there's 7 billion, almost 8 billion people. Not everyone's going to agree with you. Not everybody's going to back you. Some people will dislike you for inalienable character traits that you can't change. Okay? And that's fine. That's not a problem. As long as there's no insight, insightfulness to, to violence, as long as someone is not trying to physically attack you for that, you just got to man up. You just got to man up and say, some people don't like what I do. Some people don't like the way I live. You know? <clears throat> and take the law out of it. And that's how we govern reasonable debate. But that's, that's all been gone now. That's all been gone. And that's because we have allowed ourselves to abandon, we mentioned before, to abandon all objective truths and go, right, now all bets are off, everything on the table. Um, you can do what you want, be what you want, say what you want. But if you disagree, you're the problem. So they're not trying to create this kind of collective society where, ironically, for a group of people that talk about diversity and inclusivity and equality so much, there is no equality of thought. There is no diversity of thought. Mm. There is no diversity of opinion. None. Zero. We're so diverse. Unless you disagree with us. <laughs> yeah. It just, it, it, it makes, it makes uh, no sense. Yeah, it doesn't feel like, like there's an open mind, you know. It feels like it's closed off preset ideas and mm. these are our ideas. I'm sticking to them. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, completely closed off. I mean, there's, um, I think, we, look, we, we, we make problems of the wrong things as well. So there's, there's a, there's, I went to a, a cafe recently and on the counter there are, there was badges you could help yourself to and it says my preferred pronouns are and there was all these different badges he, she, whatever them are. and you could put that badge on whilst you were ordering your coffee it's madness it, it, what, why does why does that exist but if you question that and I am questioning it openly you know you, you consider it to be in some way no wh why are you taking something that nobody's asked you about and making it an issue No, nobody wh why are we doing that why are we wearing banners, putting banners in the air and saying, this is, this is my identity, you know, and, and then making issues out of these things that, that don't belong. They don't belong there, you know. And that was the whole issue as well with the, like the Black Lives Matter movement. There was an important point to the Black Lives Matter movement. But it, again, it, it, it puts people in these groups of identity and ignores the rest. So it yeah. creates camps of us and them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it, it makes people feel uncomfortable. But what makes people feel more uncomfortable is talking about all these things. Because, and because they're so benign. How could you disagree with Black Lives Matter? Like, well, well put you in a position where you can. How, help for heroes. You disagree with help for heroes? Well, technically, yeah, but let me explain. How, how dare you? So, what I mean, it, it, because, they're, because they're such benign statements, how could you possibly disagree with that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. But they, because they're, and, and that's partly what these groups do. They make themselves seem so benign and so, um, so moral and so justified that any, Free thinking liberal person couldn't possibly disagree with the sentiment, and then things occur within that group that you don't, you know, don't that we don't approve of. You don't see, yeah, you can't really argue with it either. But the problem is, people people don't want to, their their ego is so attached to that group that they're in. That they, if that, but they don't even fucking realize that those ideas that they have are not even their no. idea, they're just ideas that have been fed to them, family. TV generation programmed in. It's not their own individual yeah. thought. Going back to where your point, that's where I think it's a good thing for people's beliefs to be challenged. But then you, you realize, is it does it work? Does this model work, yeah. or is it bullshit? Mm. And people need their beliefs testing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And otherwise, what's the you know what's you're never gonna you're never gonna be any different. Mm. No, you're never gonna be any different. And don't get me wrong, like I. I don't care. I don't have a dog in this fight. I don't. If you want to be, be a be a woman or change your, your sex or your gay or straight, well, I, I don't care. Be whatever you want to be. Like genuinely, I don't care. If that's your path to happiness, by all means, follow it. You know, I'll support you. I, I, I have no issue with any of these things. I have an issue when your um, 
your weakness as a human being is so innate that you want to try to govern who you've become by telling me that I can and can't say certain things. Or you want to get that enshrined into law. That's what I have a mm. problem with. I have no problem with you being who you want to be. Go and do it. You know, I don't give a fuck what you do. I mean, is, nobody cares. I, I don't know why you're attempting to change. I don't know why you're wearing a badge. Just, just get on and be what you want to be. It's fine. And I think a lot of this comes down to, wait, so in my opinion, this is, we are the weakest generation that's ever existed in the face of the earth. Um, and I think this is a manifestation of that weakness. But I also think, and it's an interesting point, is that most generations before us have had something, generationally speaking, that has bonded them or united them. There's been, there's been an enemy. There's been somebody to fight. Yeah, so you know, you go back to the to the sixties and to the civil rights movement. That was a real thing. You go back to the nineteen hundreds, nineteen twenties, and the suffragette movement. That was a real thing. These were real, genuine changes that needed to happen in society. Real, genuine changes. You know, you go back to the the seventies and eighties with Harvey Milk. You know, and um, trying to get um, gay rights um, into the into the statute books. That was a real struggle. It was a real thing. It needed to happen. No one argues these these weren't real things. The Great Depression, the Great Wars, we had real things to do. Society desperately needed to be changed. We needed to progress. We've got to a point now, generally speaking, obviously society is not perfect, I'm not making that claim, but we've got to a point where we are pretty fucking good. We are pretty fucking good. We are pretty fair. We are pretty equal. We are pretty inclusive. Um, we, you know, we're, we're in a good place as society. All uh, right, okay, now what? I would have loved to have marched with Martin Luther King. You know, I, I I would have loved to have been a soldier in World War Two, so I, I could have proven myself. So I had something to to, to give stature to, to 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 who I am as an individual. It's like, well, now people look around going, right, well, now what do I do to to be an individual? Oh, there seems to be no clear path because there's no clear fight. Everything's comfortable now. So let's join these groups and let's let's make things not make them up because they're real things, but let's push these things as if they're real, genuine social issues, um, and they're not. And the amount of times that I've heard. Um, the uh, the trans issue compared to <laughs> to the civil rights movement on social media is insane. Like, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. You know, you do a massive disservice to the men that, that fought the civil rights movement when you're trying to compare, um, you know, the rights of you know not point one percent of the population. It's it, it's it's a madness. It's an absolute madness. But I, you know, I say that and I'll be accused of being a transphobe, which I'm you know I'm not. I just think it's madness that we try to politicize these things and then try to govern the way in which the debate goes. Mm. And it's kind of sometimes I always wonder like where where it actually came from, like what it sprouted. Like where did the, where was the first like seed of or call, you should call me a woman rather than a man. Yeah, but like who who was the, what was the first what sparked that and then how has it got? I like sometimes it's I like, don't know. I think a lot of it is driven like from the media. Well, like, yeah. That's what I get the sense of. And then people at the like these people like me and you, normal people at the bottom, they create a scene out of that, and then these little groups, these little factions, start to grow from there. That's absolutely correct. Yeah, I think that's I think that's true. But there's um, I've mentioned to you guys before. There's a there's a psychologist called Jonathan Haidt in America, um, professor of psychology from New York, and he's done a lot of research into this. The sort of right, where did political correctness and outrage culture and demonetize it? When when did this happen? It's a very recent thing. And all of it appears to ha sort of come into place between 10 and 15 years ago. And it marries perfectly well in terms of its prominence, its rising prominence, with the birth of Instagram um, and Facebook, which I think was 2008, 2009, when those things became sort of really global. Um, and it gives people a platform. Um, and that platform is used to social, uh, to, to virtue signal. We want to be seen to be doing the right things. So... That's, I think that's honestly where it comes from, which seems like a really benign answer. It's almost too simple. But that's what happened. Social media has made narcissists out of all of us, you know, and none of us want to risk going against the crowd. It's of course, and for everything. You know, and that's that's the way it should be. So if you have a, a different opinion, that's a dangerous thing socially. Mm -hmm. You'll be outcast. It's a very dangerous thing. So that's, yeah, that's, that's, where this, that's where this started from. And I think also the fact that there is no joint fight now for us, generationally speaking, um, I think that plays into it as well. You know, because we want to. We, we, I mean, fundamentally, most people are good, you know, and we want to be seen to be acting for the social good. We want to be seen to be, yeah, I'm against this and I will fight that. And I'm, I'm here for, for the collective. We want, we, we want to be there, but we don't like accepting that we've, those fights predominantly have been won by previous generations. And what we should be doing now is, is doubling down on the, the battles of the past that have been won and taking that forward and going, we've come a long way. 
a long, long way. But there might be people out here say this, this society is broken and we're, you know, this is a disgusting society and capitalism is evil. We're more racist now than we've ever been. It's like, really? Are, are you honestly going to... We're more racist yeah, now than we've ever been. Bullshit. It, it's provable bullshit. But what's... I mean, provable. You can show you this. It's nonsense. You know, we're more homophobic now than we've ever been. This is, it's, it's nonsense. This is nonsense. But these narratives have been spoken about and people people believe them. It, and the, fa- the facts and the figures don't back any of this up. Mm. You know, this is the most equal, the most fair society that has ever existed in the history of mankind. Now, the problem with that is, is that we're not, we haven't gone as far as we could. We're not as perfect as we could be. So what people do is go, we're going to, we're not where we should be. It's wrong. It's wrong. So no, no, we're 80% there, 85% there. We're making progress. You know, you don't change the entire system. Because, because we're not exactly where we should be. We could always be better and we can always strive for more. But um, when people say these kind of things, it just it makes me realise how unbelievably sheltered they are. You know, that you genuinely believe that we're living in a society that is somehow fundamentally racist. We're not. Fundamentally homophobic. We're not. Fundamentally bigoted. Fundamentally misogynist. Like, we're not. And we're provably not. You know? And this comes back to the culture wars. It comes back to the identity wars. But I think you're right in terms of the media stuff. Because, like, all right, so I grew up in Bradford. And I and I always thought, like, oh, it was, like, I never felt like there was any issue between, like, black, white, Asian or anything like that. I went to a school that was properly mixed. Mm. And then I would see on the news or, like, in a paper or something, like, oh, racial tension in Bradford. <coughs> and I was like, where, fuck is, where the fuck yeah. is that? Like, yeah, someone yeah. tell me that I can't go to school and I'm going to be punched by an Asian lad or attacked by a black kid. I'm not. I'm friends with all these people and it kind of like fucked with my mind a bit. Like, why are they saying this? Like, yeah. these, yeah. and then these journalists or whoever, they don't even live in my city mm. and they're just trying to cause shit for what? And I was, it fucked, it fucked me off for like ages. I was just like, I just don't get it. Like, I really don't get it. I couldn't understand it. I didn't, uh, and being young, I guess I couldn't see what the benefit would be to whoever's saying it. Which divide and conquer. Exactly. Now I now I get it. Oh, it's like yeah. And what they what they do is, is they take something that is so does racial tension exist? Yeah, of course it does. Does racism exist? Of course it does. Does homophobia exist? Of course it fucking does. No one's saying that. But what people will do, well, people you're know, talking about the media, is they will take the very worst incidents they can find say in Bradford, or the very worst homophobic attack they can find, mm. the worst case of racism they can find. And they will report that all day long. They will go, oh my God, I can't believe this is still happening. Going, that incident that we've just reported, that's a one in a million. Look at the yeah, stuff. Yeah, but people get scared by that and think, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. So when I say, you know, we there is no such thing as institutional racism in the West, when I believe that, systemic racism doesn't exist. Institutional racism doesn't exist. You can come back at me in a minute if you want. I'm not saying racism doesn't exist. I'm not saying that. Not, they will always be racist out there. Always, on both sides. You ain't ever going to get rid of that. You ain't going to get rid of individuals. Mm. There's always going to be some guy that hates black guys and black guys hate white guys. It's forever. What I'm saying is that we've got to a place now where you're no longer not getting a job because of the colour of your skin. You're no longer not being denied top positions because of the colour of your skin. And you've only got to look at the side to see that's true. You know, from Obama to the chief of police, you, you go into Chicago, where the entire city council is, is like 85% black, the police force is, you know, 67% black. So institutional racism, we've managed to get rid of that. You know, and that, that's that's huge. You go about 60 years ago, that institutional racism was massive. You know, if you were a black family in Detroit in the 60s, you were being turned down for car loans that white people would get, based purely on the colour of your skin. So we've made massive, massive, massive strides. Um, so these things on an institutional level don't exist. Okay, they do exist on a personal level. I'm not saying if you're a black guy, you won't face racism. You, I'm sure that you will. I'm not saying that if you're a gay guy, you won't get some homophobic comments. Without a doubt, you will. There are some nasty people out there. What we're saying is that as a society, we've got to a place where we've managed to eradicate most of this stuff at an institutional level. But every time I say that to people, they look at me like, like, I'm, a, like I'm a scumbag and I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm like, no, if you look at this, you will see. These are problems that society has had that we've managed as best we can to control, but we can't eradicate it. Not, 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 not fully. But we, we, we can eradicate it at a system, systemic level. Mm. But the, these, be, some people would just like you say they would just never, <coughs> it would never stop, because people are just going to hunt for that perfection. That would, will never happen. What do you think, George? You're, you're the only black guy in the room. <laughs> um, so, no, like, seriously, what do you? I mean, what do you think? Your opinion, you know, matters. 
What I would say is, I don't know, I think a lot of it is, it's how you think. Like, I, I grew up in Mauritius and like didn't even know what racism was until mm. I moved to this country, you know. Then, yeah. yes, I experienced some, some racism mm. throughout primary. Um, a little bit in high school, growing up through life, but then I could have let that be my my, my baseline, you know, or all white people are yeah, like yeah, this yeah. or whatever, and I, but I didn't, you know. Yeah. It didn't stop me to strive for some of the things. I got the job that I wanted, did all the things that I wanted to mm. do and didn't let it affect me. But then I also see it from the other side of, like if you're a black kid from the hood or whatever, you know, you're, you're around black people and you have these set views and these set views become ingrained in your belief. And then your belief, you start to live that out to the world, which I get. Yeah. And then you get the news, which slams people, you know, or oh, black people are selling drugs, they're doing this, they're doing that. And people make themselves little, make themselves small. Mm. And then they, they, they kind of make them shoot themselves in the leg for it that, yeah. when they shouldn't have that belief. Well, mm. it's not their fault. It's been institutionalized into them. Yeah. But then to what degree as an individual, do you have that critical thinking skills to, to see that I'm not associated with that? That's not me. I'm just a normal person like, like everybody else. Uh, well, most people don't. Most people don't have the ability to think critically. And that's just a fact. That's why they stay, they stay trapped in their ideologies forever. And <laughs> the thing is, you will, and you know this, you, you, whatever you're looking for, you'll find. Mm. If you're looking to back up a hypothesis that the West is fundamentally racist, and that's the, the, the lens that you're looking through, you'll find that. And you'll find things to back that up. If you're looking through a lens that we're not fundamentally racist or fundamentally bigoted, you'll find examples for that too. So whatever you're looking for, and that's why truth, we'll go back to the other podcasts, that's why truth is just so important. Look at what's true, look at what's real, not what you think. You've got to become utterly detached from your own opinions. Mm. You've got to become detached from them. And say, well, this is my opinion until it can be proven otherwise, and then my opinion will change. People have a real hard time doing that. That's why they stay stuck in ideologies. You know, so when you watch a lot of these debate shows, which I do, and you get, the, you, know, you get these guys on, and it will just take somebody going, that's not correct because of AB, and they'll lay it out. You know, that Dave Rubin thing I mentioned you last time, you should really, really watch that. Um, with Larry Elder, who's a black conservative guy, and you know, Dave Rubin's a, a white Jewish guy, very liberal. Um, he used to work for Black Lives Matter, um, always on the side of the underdog, which is good, a good thing on the surface. And um, Larry Elder, who's a 60 year old black conservative, just broke it down with facts and figures and statistics. And said, no, what you're believing is, is a media invention of the truth, and there's mm-hmm. reasons for that. But actually, what's going on in the street and the statistics don't back up your belief system. You know, and fair play to Ruben, as, as a result of that conversation, he changed his entire ideology um, and became very famous on the back of it. But yeah, we don't, we don't do that. We don't change our ideology, generally speaking. You know? And again, because our ideology is, that's a huge part of our identity. A huge, huge, huge part of our identity. You know? And we don't want to let go of that. Even if, it, even if it's proven to be untrue, we don't want to let go of that. That's what makes it fucking dangerous, though, isn't it? Though? Like yeah. it that needs to be fluid, I think, you mm. know? Like having this conversation here, being open, us listening to your ideas, you listening to ours. Like people yeah. need to be able to do that for a fully functional society. Yeah, and to realise I can disagree with you and not hate you. Right. You can disagree with me and not hate each other. And if and, and the fact that I love you doesn't mean I have to agree with everything you say. Mm-hmm. You know, with, with these things are not mutually exclusive. We can disagree and be friends. You know, we can agree and be enemies. They're not mutually exclusive. I don't need to agree with everything that you say. To respect your, you know, your, your, your innate right as a human being, you know, and the pursuit of happiness and all those things, I want all of that for you and for everybody else. But that doesn't mean that I need to agree with every life choice you make, you know. And the fact that I may disagree with a choice you make or disagree with the lifestyle that you embrace doesn't mean that I then want to prevent you from pursuing it either, you know. And that's I'm not anyone's enemy, you know. I'm I'm just on the side of I want to I want to know what's true. That's it. I'm interested in what's true. Nothing else. I think it, I, we mentioned it on the last one of the last episodes. I can't remember which, but it was. It's basically the fact that people don't want to deal in facts. They don't want to actually have something put in front of their face and say it's just not true. Like yeah. People say the best book to read about this is a book called Factfulness. It's it. I read it on holiday. I literally ate it in a couple of days mm. because it just it te- it's like basically tests you. There's a test at the start. And it's a test on what your view of the world really is. Yeah, like yeah. Based on what you, where you are at today, opening that book. And generally speaking, it's about like, I don't know, crime, how much of the world is in poverty, vaccination, da, 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 all this stuff, right? Standard stuff that you'll see plastered around. And I'll admit, I picked the worst case nearly on all the questions and, you know, flick to the next page and it gives you the answers. It's like, this is the best it's ever been. 
child mortality is the lowest it's ever been. Vaccination of people in third world countries, highest it's ever been. Like, poverty, the poverty, lowest, lowest, lowest it's ever been. Exactly. It's like we live in the best fucking world that's ever existed. But why do you think like this? Exactly. And it's honestly, if anyone could read any book and change your perception on what you see in the news, it, it, mm. it is that. That's it. Well, the news is just bombardment of fucking bad news all the time. And I, and I don't think it really reflects what's going on in the world. You know, no. look how big the world is. There's always going to be bad shit going on. But, if you know, it's easy to pick on all these little things. But how much good stuff's happening as well, you know? And I think... Lots. I think the media is just a big fucking control system. Oh, well, massive. I mean, look at um, who put out... Is it Netflix or Vox? One of the big kind of mainstream media has put out that um, Dear White People. Have you seen it? No, no. It's I've, on seen Netflix, it. I've, not, I've seen it. I've not I've not seen it. It's seen it on the screen. It's staggering. It, it's staggering. And they just have all of these... What is these, that about? Well, they have all these ultra-work white kids. And it's, um, it's a big lecture about, you know, white people recognising their white privilege and how we should and shouldn't talk to a Native American or to black guys. It, it, it's staggering that this exists, right? And that it was so popular. If I put out a thing, you know, dear black people, it's the, the, the flip side of it wouldn't be relevant. Now, the argument is there's, there has been a struggle, um, historically speaking, um, for equality that hasn't existed. Sorry, that, say that again. The civil rights movement has a history, yeah? Slavery has a history. At what point bigotry has a history? Transphobia has a history. You know, gay people were um, the victims of horrendous crimes throughout, throughout history. But at what point do we have, not forget about that, you never forget our history, that's a dangerous thing to do. But at what point do we, as a generation that never experienced those things, get off the baggage of our dead ancestors? At what point do we toss off and say, we've atoned for the sins of five generations ago? As best we can, we've atoned for those sins. And now it's time to move on together. At what point do we do that? At what point do we keep looking back four or five generations ago and saying, we, that, well, that's because of X, Y, and Z? At what point do we just take responsibility for ourselves and say, no, I'm not going to carry this, this ancestral baggage with me anymore. I'm not going to do that, you know? Mm. But that, that seems to be a thing that people really, really, really want to do. And, it, and, and it's, it's pervasive. Um, I mean, white privilege is one of the most pervasive things ever. There's no such thing as white privilege. You know, it's, it's just it's nonsense. What there is, definitely, um, there's class privilege, yeah? If you want to go to... Um, yeah, I grew up on an incredibly rough council estate you know, my, my dad worked three jobs, three cleaning jobs. We had zero money. We could, we had no money for coal. We couldn't put heat on the winter. You know, it's typical cliche stuff. That's how we grew up. Where the fuck was our privilege? Where was our privilege? Yeah. There's rich privilege. There's poor privilege. There, 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 was, there was no class privilege. You know, not that. Sorry, no race privilege. You know, we were not privileged in, in any way, shape, or form. You know, and, and that's the same for everybody. There's a class issue here, and that is a far deep, deeper question than um, a race privilege and nobody talks about that the difference between black and white is, is that the difference between rich and poor is, is that it's huge massive you know you compare the south to the north you can fucking already tell yeah black black guys and white guys at the bottom of the tree are far more in common than anybody else on the face of the earth you're in that same struggle no one gives a shit if you're black or white you're poor and that means more the fact that I'm poor that's that's my immediacy that needs fixing now that doesn't mean there's nothing to do with black and white that's yeah. to do with class we don't talk about that you know, and the other privilege, again, that they want to talk about is um, your attractiveness levels. You want to talk about real privilege? You know, the more attractive you are, you've got a massive advantage in this world. Massive advantage. You know, and the, they've, they've done psychological studies on this. So you should look at them. They're just, they're just fascinating in terms of jobs, in terms of earnings, in terms of income, in terms of opportunities, um, in terms of so, social cohesion. The more attractive you are, has a huge, huge impact. Huge impact on how successful and successful you are in this world. Massive. No, no, no. Those things don't exist. Uh, it's all about white privilege, black privilege. No, no, that, 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 irrelevant, irrelevant. But why? Why is that the focus? Well, because we can't change that. You can't change the colour of your skin. I can't change the colour of my skin. We can both change how rich or poor we are. But you know, do the powers that be want us to change how rich or poor we are, or do they want you to believe that I have some sort of innate privilege because of the colour of my skin? You know, and that somehow that subjugates you. Um, and the paper you come from, so now now I'm your enemy because of the colour of my skin, or you're my enemy because of the colour of your skin. It has nothing to do with, actually, if you strip that back, we're both fighting the same battle. We're both in the same fucking get-up. Mm. We're both trying to feed, this, feed our family. We, we've got exactly the same struggles. But that narrative isn't constructed. That narrative isn't spoken about. That's the real privilege, is between rich and poor, not black and white. Well, that, that, that's where the power is, though, because you were saying that the, the gap between rich and poor is so big, and the actual numbers of... Rich and poor are so vast. 
if poor people actually fucking spoke to each other and realised that, <laughs> you know, there's only 10 rich people, let's just go fucking rob them all. Obviously, it's never going to happen. But mm. I always think, like, people look at a politician like, God, they're going to change everything. No, you know, all you lot have the fucking say. Everyone has the say, not them. They're begging you for their, your vote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the one in fucking control. Mm-hmm. You're mm-hmm. getting sold to you vote with your wallet or you vote with your pen. That's it. But people never see that. Like, there's. But well, then there's it goes so back to the whole critical thinking. Divide people up, but. Mm. It's, the way the know. institution is, how school is. But that's how dangerous it is. Like, if everything move, everything will move away from TV, right? So then everything moves onto social media. That's controlled by then then companies that are mm. owned by sole people who aren't voted. Well, TV's dying as a, as a as a as a platform. It's dying. You know, YouTube is coming up, which was lauded and rightly so. You know, five years ago, as this incredible thing where everyone now has a platform. Until YouTube now decided, well, no, not everyone has a platform because I will decide we can do platform. Okay. You know, and then it, we're moving more towards sort of Netflix, and Amazon Prime that are making programs specific for their audience. So the the idea now is that there is no. Um, there's no diversity of thought. There's nobody saying, I'm going to present a case to you and I'm going to present both sides of that case. Okay? I'm going to do facts and figures for both sides and then you can decide what you want to do. You know, we're instructed what to believe. We're instructed what to think. You know, we're instructed all of the time. You know, we, we, we believe that there are, social, um, there are social and cultural problems that just don't exist. We, we know, and and that's, it's so powerful. There was a, there's a guy on YouTube, an American guy um, called Waters. He works for um, CNN, I think. But he goes out onto the street and he asks people um, if they think there is a problem with um, knife crime or gun crime or if they think that we are, as a society, are largely homophobic, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously I'm like, yeah, we think there's a massive problem. And he comes out with a statistic and says, no, this is down, this is down, this is down, murder it's down. I go, that, that, that can't be true. It blows people's minds. No, no, it is true. Mm. It's that you are being manipulated on such a huge, huge level. And it's manipulation that's very clever, it's very subtle, you know, that you just soak that stuff up. So before you know it, you are so far removed from what's true and what's factual. And a lot of this well comes back down to this pervasive idea um, that we are all equal. And obviously we're, we're, not, we're not all equal. We're not all equal at all. That we're all of equal worth. We're not all of equal worth. Um, and But we've bought into this as a culture. We've bought into this as a society. You know, So we're trying to create this, this playroom, I'm sorry, this playing field of equality that does not and cannot exist. And I think if we had a conversation said, no, we're not all equal and we're not all of equal worth and that's fine. And the reason we don't have that conversation is because if we're not all equal and we're not of equal worth, then it comes down to you as an individual to increase your worth. And you don't want to believe that it comes down to you as an individual because that puts you in a position where you have to do some fucking work. That puts you in a position where you no longer have anyone to blame but the man you see in the mirror. It's like, no, I don't want that responsibility. It's not me. It's the black guy, it's the white guy, it's the straight guy, it's the homophobic guy, it's the government. You know, that's why I'm down here. Mm-hmm. No, 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 you've got to put this on you. We're not all equal. We're not all of equal worth. And you get to change that. And I used, I, I used to be the opposite of that. I was going, no, we're all equal. I'm not better than anybody else. Nobody's better than me. We're all the same. We're all of equal worth. We all deserve love and happiness. And it's like, no, those things are nonsense. <clears throat> those things keep people from growing up. Mm. Or do you believe that we are all equal? Well, I don't know. I think I think that's a bit fairy tale to think like that. I don't know. I think everyone needs to take personal sovereignty in their life to improve their own situation and yes. their families around theirs. So, yeah, I think that. Yeah, and we and we have we have look we have different worth in society. You know, when people say, "Well, I'm I'm, I'm not better than anybody else," and people will say that you're all the time. It's it's it's, it's well intentioned, but it's virtuous. Like, you're not better than anybody else. No, you're not better than the the guy that beats his missus. You're not better than him. Hitler. You're not better than you are better than some people. And that, again, that places in the world, it gives us something to aim at, you know? I'm not as good as some people. I'm better than some people at certain things. I'm not as good as people at other certain things. We're not equal. Um, I employ a lot of guys, and I used to run my business on the assumption that we should treat everybody the same, everybody equally, because that's, it feels right. It, it seems like the correct thing to do, yeah? It seems like the moral thing to do. And that fucked the business up. I, know, I'm, I can't treat you all equally, because this guy's problems are different to this guy's problems. And this guy brings in a thousand pounds a week consistently. This guy is lazy. He brings in two hundred pounds a week consistently. This guy mm-hmm. is not of the same worth to me or to the business as this guy. And not just to me, but if this guy's laziness and his inability to make money, he's not of equal worth to the people in his life that he loves. We're not all of equal worth. What we should do is get to a place where we are treated fairly. 
But treating someone fairly is not the same as treating them equally. We don't deserve to be treated equally. And nor do we deserve, you know, by some innate right, some inalienable existential right, that we have a right to be loved, we have a right to be happy. Um, we don't have any of those things. Those things are things that you earn. They're things that you, if you deserve it, it's because you've earned it. You don't deserve it by virtue of just being alive and being here. You know, we hear that all the time. We're hearing people in the media and people that have a huge platform. We deserve to be loved. We deserve to be respected. Do you? Yeah. Um, do you, do you, des- you deserve that? Why? Put that down for me. Why do you deserve to be loved? Just, just by virtue of your existence? No. No, by virtue of who you are, you may or may not deserve those things. By virtue of how you exist and manifest yourself in the world, you may or may not deserve those things. Yeah? How about from a child, though? Is it from a baby? Like, you know, does a baby being born into this world deserve... Oh, no, of course. Yeah, of course. I'm talking about when we get to adulthood, of course. You know, a a, a child is a different thing. Um, You know, all children deserve those things. But uh, there comes a point when you're you're no longer a child. There comes a point when you step out into the world and you need to grow up and go your own way. And at that point, you'll get what you deserve. You know, we live largely. And again, there's always, there, look, there's always exceptions to the rule, always. But the exception to the rule doesn't discredit the rule, okay? So we live, generally speaking, in a meritocracy, meaning that you will get, by and large, what you deserve. You will get, by and large, what you put in. Obviously, it doesn't always work like that. I'm not naive. You know, sometimes you get fucked over. Sometimes bad things happen. Sometimes life is unfair. But you get what you put in. And we need to be telling people, stop. Stop talking about what you are, what you aren't, what your privilege is. Stop talking about how you feel victimized, right? And tell me what it is you have done that where you believe now that you are deserving of these things. Because whatever you're deserving of, generally speaking, the world will give you. Um, but we don't do that. And the reason we don't do that, again, is because that requires individuality of thought. It requires critical thinking. It requires you to abandon victimhood status. And people just don't want to do that because it's, it's a scary place to be. It's much rather to be in the middle of the pecking order but have someone to blame for the fact you're not at the top than to strive for the top, not make it, but then be able to say it was because of the things that you did or didn't do. You know, so I think the, 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 the lie that we're all equal and all deserving of love and respect is, is pervasive. It's a pervasive lie. It's a dangerous lie. And we're born into it. And that leads to a lot of these problems with, with political correctness. Well, you, just, you, no, don't, yeah. you just don't get rewarded for turning up, do you? We book a meeting, we turn up. You don't, oh, well, I'm here. I'm, in, I'm sat in front of you, Neil, so just buy my product. Yeah. Well, it don't work like that. Life don't fucking work like no. that. There'll be five or six other people doing that same thing. And yeah. whoever does the best job or, you know, pitches it in the right way, gets it, gets it, and that's it. But that's, that's how it works. That's how life works. Like, yes... It's like, yes and no, and you, you don't get a medal for just turning up. You don't get promoted at work for just turning up the most. Or respected. No, you people say, I respect yeah. everybody. Well, mm. you're an idiot. <laughs> you're an idiot. And you're an idiot because I get what you're saying, and I get it's well-intended. I respect everybody. If you respect everybody, then by definition, respect is a meaningless commodity. It's meaningless. If you have this thing, we, we talk about respect is a great thing, yeah? It takes years to build respect, minutes to lose it. So we have this thing here that is a, a very expensive commodity, and you're just going to give it to everybody? You've just, you've just devalued it. It means nothing. You have to earn respect, all of us. Now, I will treat you nice when we meet. I will be kind to you. I'm not, I'm not going to be a dick, right? I'm, I'm not going to give you my respect straight off the bat. Mm. No, why, why would I do that? Because respect is a, is, a, is a valuable commodity. It must be earned. You know, so when we use these, these, like this, this language, you know, I respect everybody and I treat everybody equally. It's like, one, you don't. You think you do, but you don't. And two, if you're really doing that, you're stopping your own personal growth and you're devaluing the things that you claim are of such high value to you. You know, because if love and respect and dignity, if they're of such high value to you, but you're giving them to everybody, you've just devalued your own product. Yeah. Yeah, it means, it means, it means nothing. It's meaningless. Those things have to be earned. You know, we're not all equal. It's a really powerful thing for people to get their head around. We're not all equal. You have an individual. You get what you put in. You'll get what you deserve. If you're an arsehole, you'll get treated like an arsehole. You know, <laughs> you're, um, you're an individual. You're not a black guy. You're not a white guy. You're not a gay guy. You know, you're not, a, you're not a straight guy. You're not a vegan. These things are meaningless titles. These things are arbitrary to your individuality. They're arbitrary to your existence. But when people take these things that are just innately, they are the way I am. And, then, and, and and make that their entire character, you have nowhere to go after that, mm. you know? And that's why I never, I never get people say, I'm, I'm so proud to be English. Really? I, I hate Why? It. I hate it. 
proud's the wrong word, mm. you know. In fact, Doug Stanhope, the comedian, he just said an amazing piece about this. Where he's talking about being sat, pissed up with his mate in a bar, and they get into a conversation and say, "Yeah, we you know we we won the fucking war," and you know, and he's going, "Really? That was us, Bobby? Because last time I remember, we were sat in this bar doing shots. He goes, why are we carrying around? That was that was guys a hundred years ago. That was nothing to do with us. Like, I think we should shut the fuck up talking about when we won the war." And it's the wrong word, but it creates um, it, it creates a, a dichotomy in our heads where we, we buy into past history and past privileges that weren't ours and we didn't earn them just by exclusivity of our colour or our birthright. And it's the wrong word. I'm not proud to be English. It was an accident of birth, an entire right. accident of birth. I'm not proud to be from Yorkshire. I, I couldn't give a... Sh- it's an accident of birth. What I am is I feel privileged to be born here. I feel lucky to have been born here. I feel blessed to have been born here. Rather well, be born here than be born into Syria. So I'm lucky, I'm blessed, I'm privileged. Yeah, they're the right words because those words indicate gratitude and humility. I'm not proud to be from here. You know, you say, you save your pride for things you've done. That's where the only pride you. Can, what have you done to be proud about? You know, don't don't sit there and say you're proud of things people you never fucking met did for you. You know, because that again another place to hide keeps you from being proud. Well, what are you proud of? What did you do? I haven't done anything, but well, don't don't tag onto this heritage of other great men and say because I was born in the same place of them, you know, I follow this great heritage. So no, no, you don't, no, you don't. I'm I'm not proud to be English. I'm not proud to be from Yorkshire. I'm lucky. I'm I'm really lucky. I'm grateful, really grateful that I was born here. Um, but proud is the wrong word. So I, I'm I'm a proud black man. I'm a proud white man. What does that mean? What what do you mean? It you're proud to be a colour. And what does that it's mean? It's not like you had a choice over no, it, right? And, and it's, <laughs> but it's, we've, it's been bred into us so deeply that these are things to be proud of, you know, and our heritage are things to be proud of. And to a certain degree, there's some truth there. But it's, um, no, I'm, I'm here to forge my own path. Mm. I'm grateful that my ancestors made some pretty good choices and the choices they made led to my birth and led to me being here. I'm grateful for that. I get it. I've, you know, I've got it good over some other people that don't, but I'm not proud of it because it had nothing to do with me. All I can do is take the short time that I've got and make my existence something to be proud of and give that give that to my kids. But when you say I'm a proud black man, I'm a proud white man, I'm proud to be gay. I, I, I don't know what that means. And nobody, it, nobody publicly at least calls people and says, what do you mean by that? What a bizarre statement. What a really bizarre statement. You're proud of your sexual orientation. You're proud of your skin colour, for which you had no saying whatsoever. And all that does then is it puts you into a camp where anyone that is the other becomes a default enemy. No, no. No, ultimately it puts you in a bit of a fire in the it line. Is that, do you know what, you're right though, and you're the first person to say it. Like Because I've never understood like the whole people like, oh, why don't we celebrate St. George's Day? And I'm like, well... You probably you lot probably use it for the wrong reason. It's not right. <laughs> You're probably using it. Oh, I put my flag out. And, but I've never understood the whole. Even I was saying to you about that woman in the post office. Like, oh, I don't agree with immigration and foreign aid. I was only posting a fucking parcel, and she was bending <laughs> and bending this guy's ear. And I was thinking, Jesus Christ, he's trapped behind the desk. He has to listen to you. Mm-hmm. If he tells you to fuck off, he'll get sacked or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I was thinking, well, like, how how can you be opposed to? You know, people coming here when it was just a roll of a fucking dice that you you were born in Putsi and some were born in Afghanistan. How yeah. how can you ever debate it? I just for me, it, it's always blown my mind. See the thing with the thing with stuff like that, and it's interesting because I used to be the same. I used to have that same opinion, um, and I still do to some respect. Though it's more nuanced than that now. Is that you know, I'd be the guy that would advocate open borders, come what may free, and you go, no, that's that's lunacy too. That's naive too. We've always had borders. Tribes, a thousand years ago, had borders. We need borders because we need to know who's coming in and who's coming out. And we we we, we have systems in place. We have social structures in place. We have a, a health system, and we we have these things in place that are real things and come under real strain and need to be managed in a real way. An influx of people, whoever they may be, to any social dynamic changes things. You know, when I bring in two new guys or three new guys into the shop, it changes the dynamic of that shop massively. You've got to manage it carefully. Now you do that on a global scale. You know, and it damages culture. Now, I used to listen to these guys that talk about we're losing our English culture, our Englishness, and I used to default and I'd go, racist, racist. And I think about everyone going, no, there's a point there. There's a point. We shouldn't be proud necessarily of being born here, but that we do have a culture, and we've got a good culture. We've got a, we've got a, we've got a great culture. That culture should be protected. 
Can we not protect our culture without without being racist? Can we not say, do you know what, immigration is a great thing. The NHS is built on immigration, yeah? It's a great thing. But does, should there be some rules that govern it? Probably, yeah. Should there be a way of going, right, we're going to take in these people. What are the rules? Who can come in and who can't? And how are we going to govern it? And how are we going to manage it? And how are we going to integrate? And how are we going to make sure that once these guys get in, we don't have social discourse? Um, how are we going to do that? What are the rules around it? Sensible questions. Really, really sensible questions. Nobody can say these things without being accused of being a racist or without being accused of being anti-immigration. You see what I mean? Yeah. And it's, 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 it's divide and conquer again, you know? You have open borders, you have chaos. But equally, there are people in the world that need our help. They're, and we should help them. People fleeing from war-torn countries, we should help these people. The question is, how do we help them? Mm. And the reality is, the question has always been about, let them in, kick them out. Right? Well, no, where's the middle ground? You can't let everybody in, but we can let some people in. What are the rules? What governs it? And this is the same thing with critical thought. What are the rules of our engagement? What governs it? Where's the line? What makes you a homophobe? What makes you a racist? Where's the line? Why can't we have a conversation about this without you, you, you know, you, you labeling me as something derogatory, which means the conversation can't go forward. You know, and they're fascinating questions. And this is the thing, the deeper you get into this, you realize that life is complicated. The world is fucking complicated. These are complicated things. You know, when you hear these guys on social media, et cetera, and, and even the politicians, you know, on, on mainstream TV, what intention may be, we say, no, we should, you know, let them all in, have open borders, legalize this, ban that. As if it's that easy, as if anything we're dealing with is that easy. Like, no, these things are complicated and they require really deep, considered thought, you know, and that we should be able to have that. And look how divisive we've become now as a country, you know, where everyone that's for Brexit is being, you know, considered some 50 year old racist <laughs> guy. And it's just, it, it, it's, it's just madness. It's just madness. These are real issues. And we treat them actually with such disrespect, huge issues. And we just throw around words like racist, like homophobe. Like, I've never genuinely. I don't know anybody that's genuinely racist. That doesn't mean to say that I've done, I've heard people tell racist jokes or whatever. I mean, to be racist, you go to you know, 1965 Alabama and, and, and look at what racism was. And, you, and then you compare that to how that word is used today. You've, you've, deemed, you've, you've, you've taken all the worth out of that word. It's actually that now when people call, you know, he's a Nazi. It's against immigration, he's a Nazi. Or you could, I've been calling, do, you, do you know what a Nazi is? Do you know what a Nazi is? Do you know what a Nazi is? Do you know what they believed in? Do you know what they did? Do you know the atrocities they committed? Donald Trump is not a Nazi. Jesus Christ. A bad guy, a piece of shit, whatever, fine. You know? But when you throw around terms like Nazi, racist, bigot, homophobe, and you throw them around for the most petty of thought crimes or voice crimes, you, you, you take away the weight of those words. And what you do is you mean that the guys that are the real racists, the real the real bigots, they get to fly under the radar. Because now you've used that word so much that you've utterly devalued it. Yeah. Well, people always... I think Rosie said it on the podcast, and people do struggle to articulate what they really think. So yeah. they'll just use, like, the worst... Or words that they just hear the most. Yeah. So it's like, oh, racist. Someone said Nazi ones. Yeah. Racist, <laughs> Nazi's worse than racist, and I want to really upset this guy. Yeah. I'm going to call him a Nazi. It's like swear words are not really even swear words anymore. I always think, like, if I said fuck in a meeting, I'm, no one would probably care. No. Whereas, like, maybe five years ago, it would have been like, oh, what's this guy doing? So it's, people just struggle to articulate itself enough. But it be quite separate. Yeah, they do. Away from You're what right. they really say. Well, the reason, if I had this conversation recently, um, I can't remember who I was speaking to, but they were saying, oh, I know the answer to this, I just can't articulate it. I'm like, well, then you don't know the answer. Okay? And the reason you don't know the answer is, how do you speak to yourself in your head? You speak to yourself in your head with your own voice, okay? You dream in your own voice, you articulate in your own voice. You can articulate really well how to plan out a sales meeting, both of you, because it's what you do. You can articulate that. If you can't articulate a thought correctly, it's because you've not given enough time and consideration to that thought. You haven't thought it through. You don't have the articulation. You can't articulate it because it's not there. If it was there, you could articulate it, okay? And this comes back to the fact that People don't want to do that because that requires time and effort to think about things, to weigh and consider, to look at facts, find out where the truth is. So rather than doing that, they will throw out these sound bites that they've heard on Instagram or from, the, <laughs> from, from papers or from the mainstream media. They'll throw these sound bites out. And it's like, oh, you, know, you can only articulate what's there. And you haven't spent enough time developing this argument. You haven't spent enough time thinking about this. So you go to racist. Racist, the leader with a free word is not a racist. You know, he's not a racist. You can ask Martin Luther King what a racist was. He was a piece of shit. I don't like the guy, but he's, he's not a racist, and he's certainly not a Nazi. 
You know, it's, 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 it's just nonsense. What you mean is you deeply dislike him. He says some unsavory things. I get it. But why can't we stick with that rather than throwing these labels around which just become utterly meaningless? And they debase the argument. And that's where we are now as a culture when it comes back to, to the PC debate. We're in a place now where there, there's a real debate to be had, there's real questions to be asked, there's a real investigation to be done, but we have two sides of the aisle that just cannot debate these things sensibly. Because as soon as anything is said that they disagree with, you know, you're a bigot, you're a fascist, you're a racist, there's no argument, there's no debate to be had. And the reality is that somewhere in the middle of all of this, there's some there's truth. In the middle of all of it, there's truth. Why can't it be immigration is a good thing, but it needs to be managed? And the other side of that is there should be open borders. Well, that's chaos. Right. That can't happen. That can't happen. You take a step forward. Okay. I'll take a step forward. Okay. Well, you take another step forward. I'll take another step forward. Oh, that, there you go. Boom. Now we're getting somewhere close to the middle of the debate where we can we can reach a place of um a, a mature place that deals with these things maturely rather than dealing with these things in a way that means that we literally cannot have a dialogue about it. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, it's going to get worse. It's going to get a lot worse. People will not move from their ideologies and people will not move from groupthink. They won't. And the, the, the true individual will become rarer and rarer and rarer. And critical thought, what it already is, is, is a dying art form. And those people that are brave enough to speak critically, you know, Peterson, Milo Yiannopoulos, um, Alex Jones, uh, all of these guys, the, the, whether you agree with them or not, it's irrelevant, but the people that are prepared to think critically and say, hang on a minute, I'm going to speak against this social curve, they're deplatformed, they're gone. So their voice is no longer in the debate. So all we're hearing and all the generation before us are going to be hearing are voices from exactly the same place. Mm. So diversity of thought will be dead completely. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, for sure. Mm. But people just want to sit and have an hour and 15 minute conversation about this stuff. Like, I, you say stuff that I would sit here and listen more times when you're in here. Mm. But it's just because I know you live more of a life, probably, you, you know, you've read certain, you're more educated in certain matters. Yeah. So you just sit and listen, just take it in. But people are too busy to just be like, no, fuck off, that's wrong. And like you say, you don't, you don't have to agree. It's, I think it's about having a, an open mind to just fucking open. listen, you know, yeah. you take it in. Hmm. Could it work? Could it not? Yeah. And then make a decision based upon that until it's challenged again. Mm. Like it's. And I think the the, the 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 biggest thing, like with my American friend, I was speaking to him when he, he kind of he shut me down completely, shut me down, and just labelled me a, a, a racist and a bigot. It's like I want to be able to talk to you so we can discuss these things, okay? And I want to be able to find a place that's fair. I want to be able to find a place that services the needs of me and my family, but one step beyond that services the needs of the greater community. And that's what we should be doing. You know, so what do we do? How do we get to that point where we, we create a, a micro narrative that says, this is the baseline for society. This is the minimum we're prepared to accept. And then this is the maximum we're prepared to accept. Anything between those two poles you can do, you can discuss, you can debate. Okay. But you can't say this and you can't do that. Do we agree? We agree. Right. Then you let these two ideas go to war and the right idea wins. And that's what happens. But when you're trying to drown out one side of the debate, then only your idea will win. And that the reality is that we're getting into a place where fascism, real fascism is is on the rise. But this time it's for the left rather than the right, because we're in a place now where you can say whatever you want as long as you agree with this narrative. But if you speak out about that, we'll cancel your Oscars gig. We'll cancel your Netflix special. Yeah? We'll make you resign from your, your, your job as a politician. If you say anything that is counter to this. Even Boris Johnson, when he made those remarks, was it last year? They've, they've just found an article it's from, 10 years ago, from the Spectator. Years ago. And he said, he said that um, Muslim women look like letterboxes. Yeah. Right? No, but racist, that's not a racist comment. Ill-timed, perhaps. Insensitive, definitely. Um, racist, racist? Was he? No, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a racist comment. It's a stupid comment. It's an ill-timed comment. But equally, if that same comment had been made by um, Frankie Ball on stage, everyone would have laughed at it. It would have been humorous, you know. So I do think we've got also got to a point where we have we've, we've lost our sense of humor. We've lost the ability to laugh, and we've lost the ability to be able to say what you just said is fucking moronic, and I disagree <laughs> with it completely. But I don't think you're the same as Hitler. <laughs> you know, and, and and we've lost that. Yeah, it's like the idea that you can't. Don't ever say black. Don't ever say Muslim. <laughs> don't ever say gay. Don't ever say trans. Don't even don't even say these words. 
don't know, we'll say them and we can make some jokes out of it and it can be funny and we can all get along. You know, my old business partner, um, uh, Zach, is, is, is a devout Muslim. And we used to go back and forth all the time. You know, I used to say much I would disagree with X part of his religion. He would disagree with my worldview. And we'd have great debates about it. And not once was that guy ever offended. Not once was he ever pissed off. Not once did he ever offend me. You know? And it's the other thing. This idea, I'm offended. Grow the fuck up. Grow the fuck up. I don't have time for adults to get offended. I don't have time for it. Not, you get offended by what? There's things to do in the world. There's real things to do. Get on being an individual. Get on building your own life. You know? Get on doing something that, that matters. What do you mean you're offended? I don't mean, being offended, that's reserved for children. With children and weak people get offended. You know, I have, I have no time for offence, just none. It's just nonsense to be offended, you know. And it's also a nonsense and, and arrogant to attempt to try to change the world, which so many of us do, especially in our youth, you know. You can't change the world. You will never change the world. The world is made up of individuals, okay. So if you want to change the world, change individuals. And you'll have a hard time tra- changing individuals because most of them won't listen to you. So, but what are you? Well, you're an individual. So if you're an individual, change you. Change you and then we're one step closer to changing the world. But people don't work on them, they work on the crowd and they, they join all these, these identity politics groups and they completely ignore the fact that they have so much power as an individual, so much power to genuinely change things for the good that that becomes utterly left to one side. You know, it's nonsense. Stop being offended. Grow up. Recognise that someone can have a difference of opinion to you without hating you. Recognise that someone has a difference of opinion to you is not your enemy. You know, grow up. Get your house in order. Do some real things. Work on you. What good are you? Like ask yourself that question, what good are you? Before you go out into the world and start you know, throwing around racist, Nazi, homophobic, what good are you? What are you doing? What parts of your life are lacking? Go and work on that and then come back into the public square and then maybe you'll have a voice that's worth listening to. You know? But don't just jump on, on the sound bites of everybody that's gone before you, you know, and take that on as, as your own personal identity and be proud of something you were a part of. Because you know, the, the, the reality is there's probably a, a million things in your life that are bullshit that you are ignoring. So you can concentrate on this identity nonsense. You know, go back and do that. People need to grow up. It's a brutal message, but I I genuinely believe it to be true. And I think a lot of times it's as simple as that. There is so much um, infantilism in this country. You know, we're, 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 and in the West, we're children. Emotionally and intellectually, Mm. we are fucking babies. And you see that manifest itself in our political arena. You see it manifest on TV debates. We're, We're babies, we're children. We don't know how to do this. We don't know how to debate these things intelligently and intellectually. You know, and we need to grow up. We need to grow up. Our culture is is deeply, deeply juvenile. And you see that everywhere in the food that we eat, in the films that we watch, in the way I've seen people dress. It's, we, are, we are a deeply childish culture. Um, and they, they seem like tiny matters, don't they? The way that people dress in the films we watch. They're not, they're not tiny matters. These things manifest themselves in, in the macro things. You know, we're a generation of 40 year old guys that are going to the cinema and drinking sugary drinks and watching superhero movies. You know, and meanwhile, the world's burning around us. You know, and it's a thirty-five-year-old girl, guy, you know, driving his air class with his baseball cap on backwards, and it seems petty and juvenile. Those things are not petty and juvenile. Those things manifest who we are as a culture, and who we are as a culture is as a culture in terms of a timeline of a, of a, of a human life. We're, we're five years old as a culture. You know, we need to grow up. We need to grow up, and we need to do it quickly because there's a lot of state. Boom. I think that's a good spot to finish up. Yeah, we'll wrap up on that. <laughs> cool. Pat Farnell. Nice. Thanks again. You're welcome, man. <clears throat> <clears throat>